Hello, one today is Thursday, February 10th, 2022. And this is a week and charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending tonight. Looks like our numbers are getting up again. Boy, we used to have tons and tons of people here. I was nervous we'd run out of slots, but uh, my hiding the show for whatever reason seems to have fixed that. But if you need to find the show, daylander.com slash webinar, register even if the link is old and you'll have access to all the upcoming shows. So what are we talk about? Well, obviously current market conditions, your questions on trading, your favorite stock and crypto picks. There probably won't be as many cryptos unless you want to short them. For the crypto, we'll go to crypto first, but when I open it up for stocks and crypto, just put a dollar sign in front of the crypto so I know it's not a, a stock. Now, at the last minute, I tried to <laughs> define what I'm gonna talk about and I came up with understanding markets and your edge. And you'll see why it's in quotes in a minute. Taking advantage of market psychology while not letting your psychology take advantage of you. Probably need to come up with a better title for today's presentation. Hopefully by the time I, I uh, get the recording out, I will. There's a flamer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, but as I often sum it up, all predictions about the future and a lot of stuff could happen between now and then. Anyway, that's gonna make a lot more sense in one second. So let's talk about reading the emotions of the market while embracing your own. Lately, a couple of you guys have been talking about the Mark Douglas videos on YouTube, and I watched those along with you, and they're pretty good stuff. And uh, big fan of Mark Douglas. He's no longer with us, unfortunately. And as I've said a thousand times, we were supposed to be on a project together once, and it never came to fruition and I was kind of bummed out about that and kind of bummed out in hindsight that I didn't make something happen. I guess at the time, you know, I goes, you think, oh, well, it, there's always time and, and sometimes there isn't. So if you get a chance, take it. <laughs> anyway, one thing he talked a lot about is how you may have an edge when it comes to the market and I'm gonna flesh that out in a few minutes, but on any given trade, that edge may not work. And that'll make more sense in a minute too. And I think that the, what you have to wrap your head around is the emotional nature of the markets and the emotional nature of yourself. And I have plenty of ex examples of how emotional I am. As I often say, trading in a nutshell is, at least with technical analysis, is reading the emotions of the market participants while at the same time embracing your own. As I've said a thousand times, once I started learning a little bit about neurology, I realized, you know what? We can't eliminate our emotions. If we had no emotions, we'd be institutionalized. And I've talked about that quite a bit in the past. So what is an edge? Well, your edge is the patterns and setups that you have deemed repeatable. Certain conditions in the market where you know what usually happens or maybe often happens afterwards is a certain thing. Now, the thing is your edge cannot be defined in terms of statistics. If it could, you would own the world. And the example I often give is casinos. Casinos, especially in the big dollar games, have a very tiny edge. It might be less than, a, less than 1% in some cases but they know over time they're going to do just fine. There's gonna be some losing streaks here and there, but overall they're gonna do just fine. And it's a trillion or a multi-trillion dollar business because of that. People come into the trading service and they say, Dave, what could I expect? I tell them, I don't know, because I don't, okay? And neither do the, the gurus on YouTube that claim they have it all figured out. Believe me, they don't. There's too many variables, as I'll talk about it in just a few minutes. So I tell them when they ask, what can I expect? Well, if the market goes up in an orderly fashion or down in an orderly fashion, which is less likely to happen, right? Then you'll probably do pretty good. If it goes up and down and up and down and up and down, and at the end of the year, it's up 20%, but it dropped 15 and 20% and went up 20 and 30% in between, then maybe I didn't do so well. So it's really hard to tell people what to expect, but I'm confident enough in my methodology 
And more importantly, I know my methodology is conceptually correct, which I'm going to beat the dead horse horn a little bit in a few minutes. So I'm confident enough that longer term, everything is going to be okay. So your edge must be conceptually correct. I'm going to show you a pattern here that's conceptually correct. I borrowed that term from Larry Connors years ago when I did a little coding for him. Every now and then I'd come up with a system by accident or whatever, doing my own research or taking the taking his research, taking the ball and running with it. And if I'd show Larry, if it wasn't conceptually correct, we would toss it out. Now, let's get back to what happens in markets. Markets go up, markets go down, and sometimes markets just go sideways. As I said, ad nauseum, show somebody this slide, they go, duh, right? Okay, but what happens when the market's going down and they don't want it to go down? They reason why it should be going up or they start making up excuses and they might have selective perception or perceptual distortion like I talked about last week. By the way, my F I had my trading shirt on earlier today. It's my F-bomb shirt. And my uh, my wife's like, leave it on for your uh, webinar. I'm like, all right. I threw a coat on and she said she was joking. But I thought it would it would kind of uh, dovetail nicely or, or work nicely with the, tonight's presentation, especially about the frustration and psychology of the market. But anyway, very hard to see what is. And if you think about it, and one thing I've been think, thinking about a lot, and I've written a lot about this, I haven't published it. I need to get, I have tons and tons and tons of notes. I, w I wake up every day, like I said, at nausea, and I write three handwritten pages, and sometimes it's total crap. And sometimes I come up with something really good. And, and part of tonight's presentation came from that. So I guess you'd be the judge whether it's total crap or good. <laughs> But anyway, one thing that I was thinking of is if you're truly going to be a really good trader, you have to seek out the truth, okay? What is, is. Is the market going up? Is the market going down? Is the market going sideways? And not to take anything away from an analyst from a technical standpoint, okay, from a, a technical analyst type of analyst who doesn't trade because in some cases they might actually make better analysts because they're not watching their funds dwindle in a trade and maybe not seeing the market clearly as we talked about again last week at the last week at band camp here so if the market is going up there's obviously demand for the market that that's all you need to know okay you don't have to know about the situation in nigeria or any of this other stuff okay and the media will make up shit <laughs> after the fact. I guess I'll just demonetize my video. I don't care. We can talk about shit coins a little while anyway. But the media will make up stuff that kind of fits a logical narrative. And I actually, I have a, a one of you guys put a little post up on Facebook. I'll show you that in one minute. It kind of dovetails in with all this. But sometimes markets go up and sometimes markets go down. And sometimes they go sideways. Now, it's either supply, demand, or equilibrium. And that's all you have to wrap your head around, okay? Everything else is just details. Now, what causes demand? Well, I thought I would do a presentation without quoting Tom McClellan's mother, late mother, Marion. Some people buy when they have money. Some people sell when they need money. And others use far more sophisticated methods. But... Her point was that everybody uses timing in their investing. And I think you can almost boil it down to just having money and needing money, right? So demand is people have money. One thing I was thinking about this morning is we had this great bull market and these crazy, crazy, crazy speculative stocks. And it was a lot of fun trading them. And the reason that happened was, and, and somebody, I think at Facebook pointed out, when I say Facebook, I'm talking about Dave Landry's trend traders. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute and how to join but anyway somebody was pointing out i think in the group that the assets of robin hood swelled during the pandemic and what happened is i i don't know any professional trader that uses robin hood nothing against robin hood a, a buddy of mine got in touch with me about a year ago he's like hey my son's messing around with this robin hood thing another friend recently asked me ironically same thing 
And I'm like, yeah, it's great because it gets young folk into the market, young folk, whippersnappers. <laughs> but eventually you got to make the turn and go to something maybe a little bit more professional. Now, maybe that's not fair to say, but I'm just thinking about like these kids just on their phone trading and I call them the phone traders. I think you have to kind of graduate to something a little bit more substantial than that. But anyway, long story endless, Robinhood assets swelled because the government was giving out the stimulus money. And like, if, I don't know if my daughter got any, but, but I know that if you were like my daughter in college, where your rent is paid, your food is paid, you got a part-time job, and you're getting all this, so you don't really need more money, at least for your expenses. You want more, but, and a lot of parents obviously take care of their children in college, and these kids were getting this money. And instead of blowing it, which I think is great, they traded it. And, you know, crypto went up and all kinds of things went up, especially the more speculative stuff. So they had money. You might be feeling good about yourself, the market, and just in general. And, and that's one of the things you have to be careful of. If you're in a really good mood, sometimes you might just kind of throw caution to the wind. My biggest losses usually come after an international business trip or even a national business trip. But I go travel the world back before Corona, obviously. and come back feeling like God, you know, I haven't really had a, a dud trip yet. Thank God I've made some mistakes along the way, believe me, that I regret, but overall, all the trips have turned out really well, really good, really well. Anyway, so I come back feeling good and, I, you know, I'm Dave Landry and first thing I do is lose a bunch of money. Now, the reason, especially like on an individual basis, stocks go up, is the promise of the future. And sometimes let's say the stock market overall, it might be where else you're gonna put your money, you know? Everything else is going down, might as well put in stock, stock's going up. At least it were, we'll get to that in a minute. But when I did my IPO course, the reason IPOs go up a lot of times is based on the promise of the future. And the reason you buy a stock, even though the valuation is just crazy, and I'm not gonna talk about funny minerals, don't worry, the reason you would buy it is because you think down the road something good is in the pipeline or something's going to happen if you want a fundamental trader or something like that. But then if you are just a plain old trader, you see the trend and you think, well, some greater fools will come along and this stock is in demand. I better jump on board. So that's all a fear of missing out, the FOMO. Now, why do people sell to create supply? Well, obviously, instead of having money, they might be needing money, obviously, okay? They might not be feeling good. They might be feeling bad. And by the way, if you think about it, you could just, you could just think of little microcosms along the way, okay? Think about the guy out there that's, has a million dollars saved for retirement, but has that million dollars in the market. And the market starts going down. Now he's got 900,000, 800,000, 700,000, 600,000. At some point, he's gonna have to really look hard and decide whether or not he needs to get out of the market. That has nothing to do with the market itself. And I didn't, want to get into sentiment too much tonight, but basically, I guess I am talking about sentiment in some cases. You can't trade off of sentiment, okay? Because there are some that claim you can, but you can't, okay? Like, oh, the the, the bullish sentiment is is whatever, you know, you can't claim, you can't trade off of that because sentiment's always going to be great and super high as the market's going up and it's going to go up even more. I mean, if anything, you can almost use it as a contra. But if there was a way to kind of measure sentiment in general, and I guess there is, you look at the price, right? And if price is falling, then the sentiment is negative. If price is rising, then the sentiment is good. And that's where they get these big old high numbers for the quote unquote sentiment, which I think is a bad way to try to trade. 
but how do people feel about the market, right? Now, the promise of the future, concerned about the future. Now, I'm kind of flip-flopping between individual stocks and the overall market, but it doesn't matter. Right now, I think people might be a little concerned about the future. We've been putting off inflation for the last 20 years, somehow keeping it tamped down, and all of a sudden, it's beginning to rear its ugly head. So a lot of people are concerned about that. Distant relatives are starting to call me up, looking for alternative investments other than stocks. So instead of FOMO, like the gentleman I was using as a microcosm earlier, I think there's a fear of additional loss. Now, if supply equals demand, everybody agrees on where stock prices should be. So if everyone agrees, longer term at least, there is no market. And it reminds me of Yogi Berra who once said, if the world were perfect, it wouldn't be. And that's very true. Well, if the market wasn't emotional, it wouldn't be. It wouldn't exist, right? And a lot of this is coming straight from trading full circle. I'm gonna have to put that on sale at some point in time. And if it's good stuff, I say so myself. I, I draw heavily from it in these presentations, as you probably know. As I often say, you're trading traders, not markets, and you're dealing with a bunch of emotional beings, and that's what makes a market. And guess what? One of them is you. As I preach over and over, being cognizant of your own feelings and trading and in life in general will help you to wrap your head around the emotional nature of the market. This morning, like an idiot, I went in the house right before the open and my wife hit me with a bunch of financial stuff. And I'm like, okay, so I come in and Am I of the right mindset? So I go to put on trades and I found, I found myself a little hesitant, like on the intraday stuff, playing the opening gap reversal to the upside this morning. And then once I put them on, I found myself a little hesitant thinking that, well, wait a minute, I don't want to lose any money today, right? And as Douglas was, was saying a while back, sometimes what you're focusing on is what you manifest. So you don't lose money, don't lose money. Before you know it, you're losing money because maybe you need to give that position some wiggle room, okay? And you just can't stomach the wiggle room. Whereas before I was ready to come in today and risk whatever it took, and then all of a sudden my mojo is a little off and I had to be really, really careful. Am I being prudent? Am I reading the emotions of the market? Or am I letting my own emotions Take charge. In addition to that, just to kind of like add insult to injury, for whatever reasons, I haven't been to the dentist in six years. Luckily, six years ago, he told me what to do to take care of my teeth, and I just never got around to going. And then COVID struck four years later, and and then there goes another two years, or whatever. So it's six years total. But everything's fine. I'm good. But I was nervous about going to the dentist and known known that it was going to be a painful experience and turned out to be fine other than a couple hours in a chair and very uncomfortable. But I had that to deal with that and I was thinking about putting on positions and going to the dentist's office and all this other good stuff. So there's a lot going on in my head today which could have affected my trading, at least on that stuff that I've done in more recent times, the intraday stuff as opposed to the longer term trend following. The longer term trend following, which starts off as a swing trade as you know, is not a whole lot to do there other than follow the system. I know easier said than done. But be cognizant of your own emotions. And in my trading journal, I write down all these emotions. I write down all my all my uh all my F bombs <laughs> and what I'm thinking and what I'm going through. And and one thing I'm guilty of not doing, I'm really good at documenting everything. I'm guilty of not going back in and reading the notes and, and learning from them, but I'm, I'm getting better on that. And basically, by the way, if you've been trading for 20 or 30 years, you, you get better. <laughs> you, 
you get you're always getting better. You're always you're still gonna make mistakes, but you feel like I'm getting better. Okay, so I'm gonna get better at going back and looking at those notes. So as Tom McClellan said at the AAPTA meeting a few years back, when you buy a stock, you're forming a relationship between you and the company, but you're also forming a relationship between you and everyone who's bought it prior to you. And he wanted to say that those people will screw you. And it kind of, I'm using that kind of beating a dead horse in the dovetail tonight, but it does dovetail nicely into what Mark Douglas said is all it takes is one a-hole to screw up a perfectly good trade. Somebody in a trading desk fat finger something, or there might be a institution trying to sell at a certain level or buy at a certain level. And one of one way I was blessed is is by accident i was able to hook up with a bunch of i guess i can't use that word anymore <laughs> young kids say it, it tells it means something different nowadays but i was able to become friendly with a lot of old timers who've been around for a long long time in the markets and one person once said that prices don't move prices are moved okay and i guess our job is to figure out what they're likely to do next based on how they're being moved. But all it takes is one a-hole to screw up a perfectly good trade. Now, I'm a small trader and I can't move the market, but for s and sometimes I'll put a crazy ask out there. I'm long an option. I'll put a crazy ask out there to see if somebody will take the bait, okay? Or maybe somebody's in a pinch and they need it to cover or whatever. And they're forced to buy it. And, and my little being stupid could actually trigger a chain reaction. It's not likely, but it could happen. And the reason I bring up options is that the what's fun with options is I actually go in, like if I'm trying to buy some options, and just small orders, nothing really major, whatever. But a lot of times I'm trying to get between the bid and the ask, and I and I watched I, I put my order in and I watch the ask change to the order. Well, that's me. Okay, that's me in the markets. So that could be somebody else doing that or somebody much bigger than me, <laughs> dollar-wise, not size-wise. I can't imagine too many people bigger than me, size-wise. I'm sure there's a few. <laughs> there's, there's a guy about, he's about a biscuit shy of 500. <laughs> I tell my wife, he's my canary in the coal mine. When he goes, I better start watching it. <laughs> anyway, I thought that... The trend knockout, not to teach you the pattern tonight, because I've done complete presentations just on this, but I do want to give you the rules just in case you want to do a screenshot of this. But I'd recommend you go in and watch the complete presentations where just focused on, on the TKO. But I woke up this morning thinking, how can I explain some of these concepts about reading the emotions of the market while embracing your own? And one one thing that I love is reading these, I can't reach any because they're all behind the curtain. The curtains, it's a Monty Python. All this will be yours, the curtains. That'll make sense to one of you. But what I love reading these old books on technical analysis and training psychology. Like I'm talking at least 100 years old or maybe 80 or 90 years old, whatever. Because they kind of walk you through what happens in a bull cycle and a bear cycle from a psychology perspective and the next time I find myself digging one of these off the shelf that has a really good explanation of some of these things I'll uh, make a note of the of the book but anyway I think that in terms of explaining the trend knockout I can explain the psychology behind it why it's conceptually correct and what is likely happening okay so first thing we start with is a strong trend and if a market is in a strong trend, there's demand. And people may be waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for a pullback. And it might seem like it'll never happen. And then they just throw in a towel and buy at any price. Well, we're not going to jump in midstream, although sometimes you'd be better off jumping in midstream on the upside than trying to jump in midstream and catch that falling knife. 
but usually you want to wait for some sort of setup as opposed to just buying a market because it's going up, okay? Well, what we're looking for is some players that get sucked in and some players that get spit out in a pattern. So there's a psychology behind a pattern. Now, there's some mumbo jumbo out there when it comes to technical analysis. I would never throw anyone under the bus, but I have someone that I really, really respect. And he's pointed out that he's never met a rich person who uses this arcane methodology. And I tend to agree. I may have met a rich person, but I know, but they soon they blew up soon thereafter. Anyway, I'm gonna get in trouble here if I spend too much time on that. Now, those late to game tend to be the most fickle traders, and let's just call them the Johnny Come Latelys. So you've got a strong trend, and a Johnny Come Lately comes in, and they buy at any price. They're really bad traders. They're fickle traders. They just they just give up and throw in the towel. Okay. You've ever seen? Have you ever seen the stock market? make new highs and then back off and chop around forever or whatever and then goes to make new highs again there's a push higher and all of a sudden the market comes back in and that turns out to be the ultimate top like a double top or something well that's because the people who missed it last time are, are piling in this time because they don't want to miss it what happens is the johnny come lately's usually through emotional staying power or because they're trading on a shoestring, don't have a lot of margin. The trend knockout tends to knock them out of the market. These are these are the bad traders in the market that can that can muck up your position. So when you get that sharp sell off, the trend knockout it knocks them out of the trend. Hence the name, right? And if the market begins to rally, especially if it goes on to make new highs after it triggers, then they might be inclined to jump back into the market okay so it kind of spits them out and then it can suck them right back in now short i almost said sharks <laughs> the sharks smell of blood and pounce as the market begins to drop one thing i didn't realize i've always i'm always i've always thought shorts have a bigger ego than the long side people, the, the very active shorts, especially the people who just would rather short than go long. And it wasn't until I was speaking in Vegas a few years back that I learned there was actually a methodology where it's called shorting the parabolics. The market's going straight up and the shorts just pile on trying to catch that top. So that kind of confirmed what I thought is that the shorts are a bit egotistical sometimes they confuse the issue with facts and they put some kind of valuation of stock technical or otherwise so if the shorts sell the market at new highs and the market begins to sell off they're just the opposite of the johnny come lately they're feeling pretty damn good because they're instantly validated right if the market begins to rally though then they become upset obviously because the market's doing the opposite of what they thought now here's one thing i was thinking about earlier is their methodology or one of their methodologies is selling things that are high and if the market sells off and they don't take profits and it starts going up again then they're they're trained to sell things that are go hot that are going higher so it's going to be hard for them to let go it's going to be hard for them to buy to cover when at that point in time their methodology is saying this thing is high you should be shorting it and if it does begin to go a little parabolic doing that coming out of that tko which happens not as often as i wish but every now and then it will happen what will eventually happen is the shorts will be forced to cover at the absolute worst time and that could push that market even higher <laughs> the conference is uh, on day one was uh, other people speaking and day two i spoke and uh 
I, I learned about the shorting the parabolics, and I, I had this little Mark Douglas slide. All it takes is one AL to screw up a perfectly good trade. I'm like, <laughs> nice to meet you. You know, now that I know who's who's in here uh, at these parabolic moves where I'm trend following and they're piling in. Anyway, so again, the the, the pattern, the goal tonight is not to teach you the pattern, but more that more to look for psychology in the patterns and psychology in the markets and think conceptually correct. But you do want to make sure that knockout move is meaningful. Now, a text, it, it, if you're looking at just a textbook definition of a TKO, it's a two bar low, but you want that to be on an expansion of range. So you want something that looks more like this. And again, that's to that's for psychological reasons, okay? Was it big enough to attract some shorts, you think, in? And you know, maybe some guys want to short it right here, and it's like, eh, maybe I'll just wait a little while. I got burnt last time I sold the highs. And damn it, this thing is falling. I better pile on quickly. Where recent longs likely stopped out. So you've got this nice, nice trend, you know, do 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 look like the little man in uh price is right, right? And then you know, falls off the cliff. So you gotta ask yourself, you think some longs got knocked out of this? And was it big enough to possibly shake out some longer term holders? Now, like I've said before or earlier, my goal is to predict the short short term by looking at longer term charts and jump in, get a piece and get that stop up to break even and then trail that stop higher and hopefully be in a stock for a long, long time. I'm trying to think of how long have we been? What's the oldest one in the portfolio right now? Let's see. I got the spreadsheet right here. July of 20, July of 2020. Holy moly! So we've got one we've been in since July of 2020. Okay. So could it knocked out some possibly longer term holders? I've it ha doesn't happen often, but there's there's been a, quite a few times that I can remember where I've been in a stock that looks like this, it has a TKO move looks like that, I'm out, I'm stopped out somewhere in here. And at the end of the day, I'm going, you know what, that looks pretty good. And I'll go right back in. There was one specific example in the service, that's the only one I remember that's that's documented and out there. And you could, you could if you get really bored or can't sleep at night, you can go through the archives at davelinner.com slash archives. But it was one, it was a fairly new issue, we caught a really good trend It knocked us out. And at the end of the day, I'm doing my analysis. I'm like, you know what? This thing looks good. Let's go back. Let's go back. Let's go back in. Let's wait for an entry, but let's go back in. And it worked. Doesn't always happen, but it can. So ask yourself, if you were long this particular market, would you have been stopped out? And in that particular case, I was stopped out and I did go back in the next day. So it's a great setup, at least in my humble opinion, which I know I don't have to say because it's my opinion, I'm saying it right, what could go wrong? Well, the bottom line is everything can go wrong, okay? You can have a fantastic looking setup and it can fail miserably. That doesn't mean it doesn't work longer term. It just means for whatever reason, it didn't work this time. Think of all the millions of people out there trading. Think of all the millions of variables out there. And I was just trying to think of something recently, you know, maybe. Maybe Russia will invade Ukraine. Maybe there's so many things I want to say, but it's going to come off political and probably the opposite of, of <laughs> my true feelings about how I feel about some of these things. But a lot of things can happen. The, the Fed could say something off the cuff. And yeah, they might later walk it back. But when those futures are down 100 points in two minutes, you're, you're out, okay? There's nothing you can do about that. So shit happens. All right. Any questions on this? George says best weekend charts ever. Well, thank you, George. I did borrow a little bit from uh Mark Douglas, obviously. So I, I do want to make sure he gets credit for, for some of this. Okay, lots of lots of questions coming in, lots of thoughts. All right, great thoughts. Okay. Okay, what news sources, research, due diligence, if any, do you look for for day trading and position trading? On the intraday stuff, and I call it intraday stuff, but I guess I'm day trading, but I call it intraday stuff because I want to get in 
I want to place my orders and I want to go about my life. I want to use a trailing stop, possibly a limit order to get me out at, at a certain point for half. And then hopefully, I know I just said hope, but hopefully ride that trend all day long. An opening gap reversal is a good example of that. We had one example last week. So if you go in and look at that one, my YouTube channel, by the way, subscribe to this YouTube channel if you're watching this on YouTube and you'll get all these videos and access to all these videos. But we talked about the opening gap reversal. So there's an opening gap reversal last week and there's been a few as I see them and throw them out on Facebook. I'll talk about them in here. It, but other than the opening gap reversals, what I mostly do and you know you got to realize i've done this trading thing for 30 years or 20 something years at least and my focus has been on the core methodology so a lot of the intraday stuff i haven't fully perfected except for like the opening gap reversals i'm pretty good at trading those i wouldn't rush out and try to follow me in the etf trading that i'm doing but i'm here all day and when the volatility is just right like recently you could do fairly well trading ETFs. As far as due diligence, I'm not sure what due diligence I would do other than looking at the chart, okay? So in looking at the chart, if I'm looking for a core position, a swing trade, which I hope will turn into a longer term trade, I'm looking for things like trend qualifiers, does the trend persist, is the trend accelerating, is the knockout move, like we just talked about, meaningful enough? Is it generally a clean chart, okay? If you look at a chart, it's going pretty much straight up, then it's a good chart. Psychologically, as I preach, if you were or are successful in a current or prior career, you may not be cut out for trading because you're forced to take whatever train wreck comes along, whatever client comes along, comes along. you know, like today, my little dental hygienist, you know, she she could have said, I, I don't know why I'm telling you. Like, my wife's always like, why'd you tell him that? <laughs> but she could have said, oh no, this guy hadn't been here in six years. I, I'm gonna wait for somebody to come in with clean teeth. Now my wife hadn't been in six years either, but she has a perfect set of teeth, absolutely beautiful teeth. She does nothing, okay? She might brush them once a day. <laughs> but other than that, she never flosses, never does anything. They told her a couple of days ago when she went, whatever you're doing, keep it up. Your dental care is impeccable. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> I'm water picking, flossing, brushing. Anyway, where do we go with this? Okay, what new source research? Sorry about that. Due diligence. Uh, not really. I don't think there's any due diligence or anything. I mean, there's there's certain things that, that I've been guilty of, like on the intraday thing, like forgetting that feds make an announcement on Wednesdays um maybe not paying attention to upcoming reports and things like that i don't worry about earnings believe it or not or any other news when it comes to trading i just look at the chart so uh maybe rephrase that if if, if that's not the answer that you're looking for on that but i try to be a real purist when it comes to the markets and just focus on the charts now understand why you're not in the prediction side of the markets no, I'm a trend follower, okay? Very hard to predict the markets. And it's also pretty hard to follow along, but if you look at charts, look at charts, look at charts, and George, I know you're doing a lot of analysis, and eventually it's gonna start to click with you. And it's gonna click with you when it becomes less is more. You start looking for certain specific patterns and watching those over and over again and not try to incorporate everything you've learned into into what you're doing like oh it's a double top and it's this and it's this and it's this eventually you'll be able to use all that but as you're learning you want to focus on on just one or two things okay and just watch it happen over and over again like i like i've said before find a pattern you like find 100 examples play devil's advocate find a bunch of examples that don't work i i think of something in my head wake up thinking of something start looking at charts i'm like ah Oh, whoa, ooh, look at that. Look at that. Oh, yeah, I, I, I got the Holy Grail here. And then I'm like, well, wait a minute, Dave. Let's take a look at when it didn't work, okay? And you'd be surprised how the, the selective perception, again, and perceptual distortion, where you won't really see those all those little bad trades that didn't work out. 
So definitely play devil's advocate. You're welcome. Okay. Okay. Well, you told me not to read it, so I can't read it. <laughs> Somebody wrote something really nice. Okay. And I appreciate that. It's 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 heartfelt. I, I appreciate it. All right, here we go. Narratives or alive, and I don't mean this as a metaphor. Narratives or alien in the true sense of the word. Organisms that are born, grow, adapt, reproduce, and die within electric neurochemical ocean of the quadrillions of self-organized neurons across billions of human brains. Narratives are alive, and I don't mean this is a metaphor. Okay. In the true sense of the word, organisms that are born, grow, adapt, reproduce, and die within electric neurochemical ocean of quadrillions of organized neurons across billions of billions. <laughs> the situation in Nigeria is horrible. I'm not sure where you're going with that, Greg, but the stock market is a living being, and as such, it's hard to predict, but you can follow, okay? Yeah, I'd like to I'd like to flesh that out a little further and see where you're going with that. You're welcome, Paul. Okay, thought on using current volatility and using intraday for entries in trend direction. Oh, okay, it was two posts. Okay. Thought of using thought on using current volatility and using intraday or entries in trend direction. Uh you're talking about intraday trading using the volatility. And that's one thing I'm going to touch upon in a minute. So when we get there, I'll 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 talk about that in one second. Maybe that'll that'll answer your question. So just sit tight for a minute. Uh nothing's changed with the TFM 10% system. It's still 4289. And you can go in and watch prior presentations, but the bottom line is as long as the market's within 10% of its all-time highs on a closing basis using a weekly chart, excuse me, I'm sorry, as long as it's within 10% of its 50-week closing high, which in this case right here, this is the all-time high, this is 10% below, as long as we're above that, the market in general is okay. Doesn't mean that I'm not short right now. Doesn't mean that I have puts right now, okay? Doesn't mean that you shouldn't be looking to short right now, because I think you should. But as a general statement from an overall perspective, if you're kind of like a buy and hope type and you want to incorporate a little market timing in what you're doing, then if a market drops 10% and drops below its 50 week moving average and closes there, like it did right before the pandemic slide in earnest, okay, then it's probably a good idea to get out of the market. And the next week gave you a little hope, right? And then the market dropped, what, about 30%. So you can see we've been less than 10% away from all-time highs for a long, long time. So the great thing about this silly little system is it does give you perspective. Yeah, it looks pretty nasty and ugly when you're up against the screens like this, especially if you put up an intraday chart, right? But sometimes you need to see the forest for the trees, but it is starting to look pretty questionable. When we get to the live charts, we'll get into a lot of that in just one second. A couple of random thoughts. One thing I was looking at tonight, gold was down today, the dollar was down today, stocks were down today. Gold might have been up a little bit, I already forgotten. But it wasn't enough, it wasn't much, okay? And maybe Bitcoin needs to be thrown into the mix. Well, you could end up with what's called a liquidation market where everything gets sold. And that's when the market gets pretty nasty. So when you keep an eye on that, I think the reason I put in now Bitcoin is that Bitcoin is starting to get recognized as an asset worth watching. And I'm a I'm a bull on Bitcoin longer term uh over short term i mean other than really super short term but super short term i'm bearish intermediate term i'm probably still bearish okay but it's interesting and and you know the here's where you can confuse the issue with facts 
I forget the exact figure, so don't quote me on this, but I'm going to be pretty close. 30% of our current money supply was printed in the last six months, okay, or maybe a little bit longer than that, which is a pretty scary thing, which makes a wonderful argument for Bitcoin, but Bitcoin really hasn't gotten the memo just yet, and Bitcoin tends to go down too. Now, what's keeping a dollar up? I don't know. I think that with the fiat currencies, it's kind of like the, uh, what's the best way of putting it? Maybe maybe the dollar is the dog with the least fleas. And let's hope that the dollar is always the dog with the least fleas. So everybody's running their printing presses, okay? Flooding the, flooding the world. Do I have my hunter trade on though, Andy? Let's see what I got here. All right, here we go. <laughs> Let's hope we don't end up with these someday, right? Hundred trillion dollars. I used to throw these around at lunch and stuff. Oh, I got, I got it. And throw out a hundred trillion, and then they became collectors' items. <laughs> I bought a, I bought. You can buy stacks of them. I bought a stack of them like a, I don't know, a dollar each maybe on eBay. Um, uncirculated. I should toss them out. But anyway, the fiat, the whole fiat thing is pretty scary, and and. Uh, I don't know the exact amount of time, but I have an idea in my head. I, I wrote the article, don't remember exactly, but how long do you think? And maybe I should I'll just leave a just leave a comment below. Without if you don't know, just guess though. Don't don't Google it. How long do you think the average fiat currency lasts? Fiat means it's not backed by anything, okay? Other than the government that prints it, which <laughs> it's kind of a laugh, right? Now, George was asking about volatility, and this is one thing I was thinking about and been talking about a little bit lately. The volatility of the stock market is twice what it was not that long ago. So I would recommend you adjust your size down based on the volatility for anything outside of the core methodology. Right, last week, no, week before, last week wasn't good. The week before, I had one of my best weeks ever on the intraday stuff because the volatility was whack. And to my surprise, because it was scary, and just it just didn't look like it was worth the risk, I was taking very, very small positions, probably at least half or maybe a fourth of what I normally would take. So that was a lesson for me to adjust down to the volatility of the market. And the reason I say anything outside the core methodology, the core methodology will self-adjust, okay? Uh, no, Harry, you're you're way off on that. Harry says 200 years. Nope, <laughs> it's much less than that. Yeah, it's it's scary once you um, once you know the number. So again, you want to adjust your size down, and if you're doing something intraday, okay. And the core methodology will self-adjust. So I haven't really bumped my share size down there, but I think. When it comes to being short and buying puts and such, you might want to err on the side of being a little too small. If the market does something crazy in your favor, you're going to make plenty of money with a small share size. Okay. If the market does something against you, which you could easily do, you're going to be a hurt and pop with anything other than small share size. Now, this is kind of a can of worms. Kind of hate to mention this, and this is something that we can flesh out, and, and as we have before, and we can continue to flesh out in the Facebook group. But one thing you might do is consider put, put options as a substitute for shorting, and there is a huge cost in that. And up until today, the, one of the positions that I took on has been failing miserably, and we'll see how it works out. I posted it last week. It was one from the service ADI. And I bought puts and I paid 75 cents for a week and a half or whatever it was of being able to sleep at night. So that's going to evaporate. And here's the other thing that they don't tell you another hidden benefit, right? Is let's say that market goes against you and then option expires. So let's say you put up $1,000 a contract and it goes against you $5 at expiration. You exit and you're, I have like a, an account with a, I don't want to call it a stodgy broker, but not like an active trader broker. And and they'll, my phone's going to ring tomorrow, and they're going to want me out of those options. They're going to want me out of those options by like 
two thirty tomorrow. You know, where it, it's just because it's in a you know an older account or whatever. They want you out. So even if the market moves in my favor later between then and the close or whatever, I was I, I'm going to be forced out of those options and maybe at a, at a bad time. So so that's something that that could really kind of mess you up. And ideally, what happens with the, with the short side is your timing is such to where you're not waiting around for weeks, fifty years, six months, and three days. Nope. <laughs> It's scary. Once once you realize what it really is, it is scary. So there's a cost of options and it's difficult, but you can sleep at night. So that, that option trade I put on, I put up $1,000 versus $16,000 round numbers in margin. So I could live with losing $1,000 for every 100 shares, I don't know if I can live with losing a lot more. Now, obviously it's not gonna double in value a big stock like that, but I still could get hurt pretty bad. So it's kind of a, I wish I had the right analogy, but kind of a double-edged sword. It, it could work in your favor, but it could also, it cuts both ways, I guess is what I'm trying to say without mixing metaphors too much. All right, one thing that my wife told me a while back, I guess about a year or two ago when I started the Facebook group, two years ago, I guess, maybe three now, is that the Facebook group is the best thing I've ever did. So, and everybody here tonight, I think, is in the group. So glad to see you. Thanks for thanks for attending. But you can ask for help. And, and to my surprise, by the time I get around to answering someone, five or 10 of you guys have, and girls have jumped in and helped them out. So I appreciate that. I will put out signs, signals, ogres, and stuff like that as they occur. And if hey, you've got a stock pick you like, throw it out to the group. And you know, if you're not if you're not scared to get beat up a little bit, and I think that's how you learn, then by all means, throw it out there. We'll say we like it, we don't, or whatever. And like I mentioned earlier, I will throw out an opening gap reversal every now and then. I think I threw out one last week, if memory serves, or I've forgotten what it is. Was it Marvel? MRVL? All right. We talk about crypto briefly. Everything that I've been saying for the last several months applies. So I'm not going to go through all these. We'll just jump right into the charts. If you guys want to ask about individual stocks or crypto, since we're getting ready to shift over to crypto, start asking about that now. And let me just shift gears here. Okay, a couple of things in, in crypto right now. I think I'm also short this one. Everything in orange, I'm short. Okay. And I shorted this one right before we went live. That's one reason that was slowing me down. It's rolled over. We've got a lot of Landry light. It's pulled back. Didn't quite make it to the 30, but then so far it's rolled over. So I'm short that one. I'm short this one. Just kind of imploded. Went up to kiss the 30. Not a beautiful setup, but it looks like it's going to work out. Knock on wood. This is a more of a textbook type of Landry light pullback. You got daylight, meaning that, or Landry light, as I now call it. My wife told me to put my name on things from now on. The highs or less than the moving average. It goes up to kiss the moving average. You short it as we get to roll back over. And then this one, being a shit coin, I just thought I could short it. I guess they're all shit coins if it's not Bitcoin, right? I just thought I could short it because it was going down. And I may have gotten in somewhere on a pullback, but I think it was just going down and I shorted it. I know, shame on me. But knock on wood, I think it's it's no worse than break even. As I've been saying quite a bit, Bitcoin might be a good barometer for whether or not you should be trading these shit coins, S-H-Y-T coins. If Bitcoin's doing well, then maybe the shit coins are doing okay too. Kind of like using the S&P. Not that you wouldn't want to buy stocks or own stocks if the S&P is weak, but just make sure you really like those stocks or they can trade contra to the market. I was kind of a bull on Ethereum. And lately, some negative things have come out about there might be some hanky-panky going on there. Um, I don't feel like that would be possible in Bitcoin, but who knows? There's always going to be scam artists and people scamming things. 
There's a Sheeb. Sheeb is a 220 EMA breakout. Uh, I don't know if it's just because of my interest or whatever, but if I ever go to like Yahoo, I'm always getting articles on how Sheeb is going to go to whatever, a penny. <laughs> and today's article, I think, was if you'd have put $100 in Sheeb, whatever, two years ago, where would it be now? It's like, okay, whatever. But you can see, it looks like it, it broke out on some of that excitement. They were shilling it, so to speak, and it looks like it's trying to come back in. I wouldn't rush out and buy it. You know, maybe if it took out this high, if you were trading something like that EMA breakout system. There's a few of these that are actually at or near new high, like this AXC. Now, if we take a look at percent change in here, and I think the, the night just flipped over, so they won't be that impressive. But this is what I used to do, is just buy the ones that are going up. But right now, I've been really hesitant to just buy the ones that are going up. Now, early, but Dave, I thought you said you can't just buy markets that are going up. Well, if go back and watch like Coffee and Crypto and some of the presentations I did back when crypto was hot. And when a market is in a blow and go in momentum market, like 1999 in stocks and like last, <laughs> last October in crypto, then yeah, you can just buy the markets that are going up, take a little profits along the way and use some money management. All right, you guys, any uh, crypto pairs you want me to look at for you real quick while we're here? You can see most are below the 30 EMA as I have preached as ad nauseum. That stupid little moving average, which I'm liking more and more and more, can do a wonderful job of keeping you on the right side of the market. So as you go through crypto, Okay, ergo, whatever this is. Okay, I'm not going to buy ergo unless we have Landry Light to the upside. Well, okay, you could have bought it way up here, or it's lost about 99% of its value, and you still still hasn't gotten above that moving average. One thing we're talking about the Facebook group, and this might not be a perfect example because it looks kind of thin, but Bitcoin would be a, probably a better example. What you could do is pay attention to moving average pivots. So if the market's in a downtrend, again, above the 30 EMA, Landry Light above, lows greater than 30 EMA, good. Highs less than the EMA, bad. Okay, look at this long downtrend, okay? But if it comes up to the EMA and doesn't have Landry Light, it makes a pivot and turns back down, then stay short, okay? If you have the staying power and if you are in a longer term trend following mode. So now it looks like it might be trying to turn. Okay, let's see what happens. If it gets back below the EMA, then all bets are off. But right now, it's stalling out awfully quick after just breaking out. So that has me a little concerned. All right, uh, there's not a whole lot of interest tonight in Bitcoins, and that's fine. Or crypto, I call it Bitcoins. <laughs> Some people get upset when you call uh, all of crypto Bitcoin. All right, let's uh, switch over to TC. Okay. Yeah, George, I'm still not sure exactly what you're you're speaking about or talk asking about the volatility. I have had some patterns in the past that use volatility, but they're um, I don't trade them actively, and it, it's involved shorter term volatility reverting to longer term volatility. And ideally, you want to wait for a fake out in the opposite direction. But that's way more involved than I want to get tonight. Uh, let me know what you want to work. You shouldn't be doing that, by the way, <laughs> at your level. So that's why I don't want to get into it. S&P 500, the market will do what it has to do to cause the most amount of pain to the most amount of people. The market will do the most obvious thing in the most unobvious manner. Okay. Those two things make a lot of sense. You can't trade directly off of them, but you can keep them in your head, okay? This morning I came in, we got this big lap down in a piece, giant mind F, amen, amen, Paul, amen. Big old gap, big old fat gap down, or lap down in this case, because it didn't take out the prior low. And then everybody in the world's freaking out. Oh, look, the market rallies, it stalled out. Hey, it's going back to new highs. No, it's not. So everybody freaks out at some point, and then what happened? The market imploded for the rest of the day. 
that's on a micro level you don't want to look at the micro level too much because you end up chasing your own tail but if you look at we were at all-time highs here we had a big sell-off and so far this just looks like a big retrace but the good thing is we had a little pivot here so we got something to work with we got a pivot here pivot here anything above, anything above 4600 we'll start feeling a little better about the market it was interesting if you go back about a week and you look at some of the headlines from some of the people posting videos and such and they were upside targets for s p 500 <laughs> and i'm like okay <laughs> good luck with that and you know i was hoping they were right but so far they're not but you can see ugly day today again keep an eye on 4600 i think if we take out 4450 we had a shot at going to 4250. it's not going to be all that easy though that's the problem let's take a look at bonds what are bonds doing which way are bonds headed? Anyone? Anyone? They look like they're going down to me, okay? That's the beauty of being a trend following moron. Also, I'm not short bonds or long bonds, so I can look at bonds and say bonds are going down. I don't know why I sound like Jerry Seinfeld. <laughs> What's the thing about bonds? Anyway, bonds down. What happens when bonds go down? Anyone know? Rates go up, right? Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. Stalling out a little pivot point in here. It's kind of ugly. Okay. So you asked me today how I feel. I feel like the market's going back to old lows. Tomorrow, if we take out this pivot high, I'm like, okay, well, let's just see what happens. Check back often, right? Take a look at the Rusty. Rusty's not looking too good. Longer term downtrend in place. So far, just pulling back. Looks poised to make a new leg lower. Gold was off a little bit today after trying to rally, but it's all over the place. I wouldn't get too excited about gold at this juncture, even though logically you should be buying gold, as they tell you on TV. But like I was saying recently, they sure do want your dollars. It's borrowing a line from Larry Williams when he's talking about those guys. Banks tried to make it to all time highs. In fact, I think they did. And then they shot up there today and then they imploded. So this is kind of a mine F as Paul says, right? Because it, it faked out, looks like everything's fine in the banks. And then it came back in. Financial services were doing pretty darn good, coming back, right? Stalled out today. A lot of areas like drugs and especially biotech within the drugs, not doing so hot. Nice little trend lower, nice persistent trend lower. Draw a, I wonder if it works in the new version. Let's see, yeah, draw a trend line through as many bars as possible. That's called persistency. You could also use linear regression if you wanna play around with it. I used to put a bunch of linear regression lines on a chart. It was fun to play. It's like those uh, pickup sticks or whatever. Now I just kind of eyeball the chart. But so far, just pulling back, downturn remains intact there. Health services, nice big fat rally, and then rolls right back over. Retail, same sort of action, not quite as impressive a rally. Decent day yesterday, and then today it just implodes a little bit. So it looks like it's in trouble. So right now, everything looks like it's in trouble. I wouldn't rush out and, and, and get too committed one way or the other, but I do like the short side for now. And I am seeing a plethora of stocks on the short side. Short side can be a real pain in the butt, but you can make a little money shorting. And as I preach, the good thing about the short side is it does help you to see both sides of the market. Okay, so that's about all I have to say for the market. You know, check back often. Let's see, let's watch that 10% system, PFM 10% system. Let's see if the pivot points could take it out to the upside or the downside. And let's just see if some of these moving averages, pick your favorite, the 30 EMA, the 50 simple or 200 simple, if you're looking at the overall market, such as the S&P 500, let's see if those get taken out and see where it goes. Okay, TNDM, I think was one I could not bring myself to buy because of the spread. Uh, you mean sell short? Yeah, sometimes, sometimes you have to watch it if the spread gets a little wacky, um, 600,000, 600,000 is, is kind of on the cusp of the average volume. At least a half a million is, I want, is, is what I'd like for a short. And if you go to short something like this or buy it, if it's it's going up, you kind of have to watch to see if that spread will, uh, will come back in. Sometimes the spread stays super wide, like two points or whatever. Just you're like, ah, screw it. You know, it's a great pattern, but I can't do it. You know, the heck with it. But then other times, if you watch it, they'll come in and it'll get pretty tight. And then sometimes even like a penny. But yeah, you will sometimes pay up maybe a half a point or more 
on some of these higher price stocks. You just have an instant loss as soon as you click. You just have to look, close your eyes and do it. We are the reserve world currency until China gets there. Yeah, that's that. You know, I tell you what, it, all the things to worry about. You know, there's always something to worry about. But yeah, I mean, you could someday that might happen. You know, and I'm kind of an American first guy, America first guy. And if I was living in China, I would be a China first guy. Okay, so I'm a bit of a patriot. I know that. You're not supposed to be those things nowadays for whatever reason, but I believe in America first. Let's take care of ourselves first. And if we prosper in the process, maybe we could help some other people out. But yeah, you could be darn sure that China, China, <laughs> as someone calls it, is working their butt off to um, take over any way they can. Everywhere, everyone in China and India wear their currency. Oh, Craig, you left. I'm not sure what you mean. They they actually they put it in a close. Sam says, as far as dollar strength, it could be the higher yields. Yeah, yeah. In a market technical analysis, sure. On our treasury bonds, in a negative yield would out negative year outside outside the United States. Uh, yeah, that's kind of a a little bit of a dog with the least fleas analogy. I hear you. Have to be brought, have to be bought with U.S. dollars, hence the dollar strength. Ah, okay. So what he's saying is, if you want to chase yield, if you want to try to make some money, the only place to make money on the interest is United States because our bonds are going down. So you have to put that money into dollars. All right, that makes sense. So it's a good argument for why it's a dog with least fleas. A one good argument. All right, George says he's going to do 25 trades at a small size. Yeah, good for you. Yeah, do 25 trades. Yeah, Jeff uh, Jeff said the spread is horrible in some of those options. Yes, it is. What you have to do is maybe go a little deeper in the money, and you also you also just play a little game with them, and you'd be surprised uh, how close sometimes you can get to that bid. You know, because sometimes the bids are just crazy. But here's one thing you got to realize is sometimes the bids are just so out of whack you know, like bid might be less than intrinsic, right? So you might bid up a little bit, even though it's kind of a stupid bid. And I'm shocked sometimes. Sometimes I'll just throw out an S&G bid and I'll get them. So play a little bid ass game when you're doing that. You know, it's like, okay, just keep up in it and see what happens. Yeah, Harry, you got the right, Harry got the answer for, for the uh, fiat currencies. I'm not going to say what it is. IRA, so I have to buy puts. Yeah, you can buy puts in an IRA, uh, Jeff. Yeah, you're right. So yeah, instead of shorting, sometimes you could you could just buy puts if you have an IRA because you can't short an IRA. All right, any any other stock picks you guys want me to take a look at real quick? All right, going once, going twice. Well, as usual, I want to thank everybody for attending tonight. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule. Anything unanswered, if you're in a Facebook group, bring it up there. We'll noodle with it a little bit. If you're not in a group, daviddavelander.com or davelander.com slash contact. All right, Sam wants me to squeeze one in real quick. I'll do that for you, Sam. CMPG. Yeah, this looks like a potential short, but what I would do right now is I would find stocks at higher levels to short. Take a look at like the semiconductors, okay? And if we back this chart way out, Okay, you can see semiconductors are way up here. So if they crack in earnest, they got a long ways to go. All right, they're coming off all time highs. At this level, and I saw a few stocks tonight that were pulling back from major, major lows. At this level of the of the longer term bull market, possibly coming to an end, let's hope not, okay? But believe in what we see and not in what we believe, right? Then you want to short stocks at higher levels. As the as the bear market, God forbid, matures, then you're left with stocks that are in longer term downtrends and then you'll, you'll have to short those lower level stocks. So I would I would go after the ones at higher levels first, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. And then should we get into a downtrend, I would go after the ones that are in longer term downtrends. All right, thanks everyone, I appreciate it. Again, everybody have a great weekend and may the trend be with you. Thank you so much.